We begin with our prayer to St. Jude. St. Jude, glorious apostle, faithful servant, and friend of Jesus, the name of the traitor has caused by many, but the Church honors and invokes you universally as the patron of difficult and desperate cases. Pray for me, who am in need of God's mercy. Make use, I implore you, of that particular privilege accorded to you to bring visible and speedy help where help was almost despaired of. Come to my assistance in this great need that I may receive the consolation and help of heaven in all my necessities, tribulations, and sufferings, particularly. And that I may praise God with you and all the elect throughout all eternity. I promise you, O blessed Jude, to be ever mindful of this great favor. I will honor you as my special and powerful patron and encourage devotion to you. St. Jude, pray for us and for all who honor and invoke thy aid. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Put out into deep water and lower your nets for a catch. We're presented today with three examples of men who find themselves in the presence of God and find themselves unworthy. I am a man of unclean lips. As one born abnormally, I am the least of the apostles, not fit to be called an apostle. Depart from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. And the reality is, they're absolutely right. They are not in themselves worthy of the commission they receive. They're sinners. St. Paul's a murderer for crying out loud. Peter's just a simple, smelly fisherman. They are not worthy of the grace they receive. But that's not the point. They're called. And not knowing where the call will lead, they respond. Theirs is an obedience. And truly a blind obedience. And the very idea of that makes our culture uncomfortable. Our culture functions largely under what we might call a power ethic. An assumption that somehow the measure of the person is related to power. This generally leads to one of two opposed frames of thinking, either that might makes right and those who can get power obviously should wield it, or that Fundamental equality demands that all power should be as evenly distributed as possible, never mind that some people are just going to be better at using it than others. It follows naturally that our society has a really negative notion of obedience. Obedience is at best a sign of weakness, at worst a pathological condition. If our value is measured in power, obedience can never really be a virtue. And God calling us to obedience then suggests that God's a bully or a tyrant. 
Even if we are objectively inferior to God, it's an insult to the person for him to point that out. Not to mention the idea that absolute power corrupts absolutely, and God should be careful. And a problem comes in when we start to read the scriptures and project into the texts these issues that we have with power. But for Jesus Christ and the New Testament, there's a very different understanding of the human person that's at play. Our Lord warns of the dangers of power, and yet he clearly establishes hierarchy. Power has one legitimate purpose in his kingdom. It is there to serve. Meanwhile, there is a measure of the person, a measure by which we really can recognize one person as being greater than another. And the measure is love. And if we can read the scriptures, not with a power ethic, but an ethic of love, it radically changes the way we read the sacred texts. We can begin to realize just how intimately obedience is linked to love. Sure, there can be obedience without love. There can be tyranny and oppression or just the simple requirements of order and duty. But there cannot really be love without obedience. The love we are called to is an obediential love. The word obedience etymologically means to hear, to hearken to the other, implying a readiness to respond. And indeed, what would love be like without that listening? How indeed could we ever seek the other's good if we have not first heard what that good is. And of course, we do this naturally when we fall in love, right? We ask the beloved, what can I do for you? What do you want? We practically beg the beloved to put us under obedience that we might serve them and show them our love. And that's all fine and easy when the feelings are there. But it remains an essential part of love even when they are not. Far from a sign of weakness, obedience offered in proper and authentic love is a sign of perfection. Alongside humility, it is easily the virtue for which we hear our Lord most often praised. For he was obedient even unto death, not out of a state of inferiority, but out of perfect love for the Father and for us. And when that obediential love is in us, it always comes as a response. As St. John says, in this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that he has loved us. God has loved us and loved us first because he is love. All the obediential love we offer is a response to what we have received. And the only reason we are even capable of love is because he has loved us. And so while our passages from Scripture today speak of a kind of blind obedience, as Isaiah and Paul and Peter are examples 
of following the Lord and not knowing where it's going to lead, they are not examples of blind faith. Their faith is rooted in an encounter with God. They have seen the Lord's power. They have, each of them, encountered his love and his forgiveness. Their obedience is a response to the person they have encountered. And yet, the obedience they offer necessarily remains blind. God's ways are not our ways. God's thoughts are not our thoughts. God is not so small that he can fit in my head. And this is good news. If I could actually understand all of God, he would not be a very interesting God. Thank God, God is greater than me. But it means that the Lord and his church will often call us to a response. We will not fully understand. Even as we are encouraged to come to the greatest understanding that we can. Yet ultimately, having encountered his power and his love, we can respond with love and obedience even when there are things we cannot see. This blind obedience is exemplified in the Blessed Virgin Mary in her constant willingness to say yes to the Lord. To say yes to the greatest mysteries in receiving the Incarnation, in remaining at the foot of the cross, and in awaiting the birth of the Church. And so in our lives, as we seek to imitate her, we need to put out into deep water and lower our nets for a catch. We need to offer our obedience to God with a certain blindness, not knowing where it will lead. But only because we have encountered his love and his forgiveness first. Because we have come to know him who is truly present, body, blood, soul, and divinity in this Eucharist. May the obedience and the love of the Blessed Virgin Mary lead us to the obedience and love of her Son, that we might, in response, leave everything and follow Jesus Christ in his church, that we might be ready to cry out, Here I am. Send me. And let us conclude with our novena prayer to Mary. O Immaculate Virgin Mary, Mother of Mercy, you are the refuge of sinners, the health of the sick, and the comforts of the afflicted. You know my wants, my troubles, and my sufferings. And by your appearance at the Grotto of Lourdes, you made it a privileged sanctuary, where your favors are given to people streaming to it from the whole world. Over the years, countless sufferers have obtained the cure for their infirmities, whether of soul, mind, or body. Therefore, I come to you, with St. Jude as my patron, to implore your motherly intercession. Obtain, O loving Mother, the grant of my request. Through gratitude for your favors, I will endeavor to imitate your virtues, that I may one day share in your glory. Amen.